Unit 10. Gateway. It has been suggested that organic methods, defined as those in which only natural products can be used as inputs, would be less damaging to the biosphere. Large-scale adoption of organic farming methods, however, would reduce yields and increase production costs for many major crops. Inorganic nitrogen supplies are essential for maintaining moderate to high levels of productivity for many of the non-leguminous crop species, because organic supplies of nitrogenous materials often are either limited or more expensive than inorganic nitrogen fertilizers. In addition, there are constraints to the extensive use of either manure or legumes as green manure crops. In many cases, weed control can be very difficult or require much hand labor if chemicals cannot be used and fewer people are willing to do this work as societies become wealthier. Some methods used in organic farming, however, such as the sensible use of crop rotations and specific combinations of cropping in livestock enterprises, can make important contributions to the sustainability of rural ecosystems. Exercise one: People usually accept more restrictions on their freedom during times of crisis. There is a widespread belief. That as long as everybody goes along with the stricter rules, then we'll all get through it, and we can get back to normal after it's over. That was true during the depression, when the U.S. federal government exploded in size. It was true during World War II, when the people accepted all kinds of rationing and wage and price controls. As a matter of fact. Expanding government powers in times of emergencies is so easy and well accepted that it has been the formula for expansion even in peacetime. Convince the public there is a crisis and then do whatever you want. There has been the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the health insurance crisis, the crisis in education, the housing crisis, the prescription drugs for seniors crisis, and more. The latest is the war on terror. Time will tell, but the expansion of government powers always changes the balance between those who govern and those who are governed. Exercise two. Generally, advertising research has applied objectives. Its purpose is not to uncover basic concepts and theories that explain human behavior. Rather, it is to help stimulate sales of specific products or services to specific categories of consumers. Not surprisingly, this use of research aimed at discovering how to manipulate people has aroused considerable criticism. Although the research tries to demonstrate the effectiveness of particular advertisements and campaigns, critics claim that no scientific cause and effect relationship can be established between a given ad and the product or service it seeks to sell. Many social scientists believe that there are just too many uncontrollable variables in almost any situation to prove that particular ads actually work. In spite of these criticisms, however, those preparing for funding ads believe that advertising works, and they are the ones making decisions to spend millions of dollars to promote products and services. Exercise three: Because speakers have to establish agreement on meaning, languages are regional. Languages were not established by expert committees or by decree. But gradually evolved out of people's interactions with each other and their desire to communicate. Separation, physical or social, breeds new dialects. Yet as long as there is interaction, language boundaries are more fluid than names for languages or national borders might suggest. For example, I grew up in Germany, a stone's throw away from the Dutch border. My parents' version of German, their local dialect rather than what they were taught at school, is very similar to the local dialect on the Dutch side. The Germans might not understand High Dutch, and the Dutch may not understand High German, but the farmers on either side of the border use pretty much the same language. They are neighbors after all. The language is part of the West Germanic dialect continuum. Exercise four. Fashion functions as fashion only in the environment for which it is determined, and this applies globally. 
This means that a bathing costume at the opera will not be perceived by visitors as fashionable or unfashionable, but first and foremost as an incorrect or unsuitable garment. Objects are perceived in context with their surroundings and processed cognitively. Advertising takes advantage of this insight in order to attract more attention, among other things, via an unusual locational reference. A bathing costume will not, as long as society has not agreed on this, be accepted as fashion for the opera. Quite apart from the functional and moral components, the bathing costume lacks the added value that refers to the environment of the opera, referential aspect. Such as elegance, festive quality, or glamour. However, the contemporary, flexible society no longer upholds the vestimentary demands of space that nineteenth-century bourgeois society made, and that continued to have an effect into the nineteen fifties. For example, evening wear at the opera. Exercise five. Every culture maintains certain key beliefs that are centrally important to that culture, upon which all secondary beliefs are predicated. These key beliefs cannot be easily given up, because if they are, everything falls, and the unknown once again rules. Western morality and behavior, for example, are based on the assumption that every individual is sacred. This belief was already present in its nascent form among the ancient Egyptians, and provides the very cornerstone of Judeo-Christian civilization. Successful challenge to this idea would invalidate the actions and goals of the Western individual, would destroy the Western dominance hierarchy, the social context for individual action. In the absence of this central assumption, the body of Western law. Formalized myth, codified morality, erodes and falls. There are no individual rights, no individual value, and the foundation of the Western social and psychological structure dissolves. The Second World War and Cold War were fought largely to eliminate such a challenge. Exercise six. Satire's favorite targets are those who imagine that they are wiser or better than others. In some periods, that means self-righteous clergy, who show off their supposed superiority to the laity. Since the age of reason, the intelligentsia plays the same role. Intellectuals are drawn to theories that offer the key to human affairs, and they almost always imagine that theoretical knowledge is far superior to practical wisdom. From the satirist's perspective, the reason is obvious: if theory rules the world, then theorists should rule the world. As Tolstoy puts it, it is natural and agreeable for learned people to think that their class is the basis of the movement of all humanity. And if we have histories that trace the cause of events to men of ideas, But none to the activity of merchants or shoemakers. That is only because merchants and shoemakers do not write histories. The worldly success of merely practical people therefore seems to them an injustice to be remedied. The wealth of those who do or produce things seems like some sort of trick, if not theft. Exercise seven. An important norm that people learn is that when we become angry. We need to hold our tempers in check and not physically assault other people. Thus, we are socialized to avoid behaving aggressively in a physical manner, and this belief inhibits us from behaving aggressively. However, the media present a continual stream of messages where violence is used successfully to solve problems. More often than not, it is the good characters or heroes who use violence in a rewarded manner. This stream of media messages, in which violence and physical aggression is portrayed as a good thing, gradually alters our belief that violence is bad. That is, our socialized inhibitions gradually erode. This gradual wearing down of a person's socialized beliefs that the use of violence and aggression is socially unacceptable has been labeled the disinhibition effect, 
We are socialized in a way to inhibit aggressive behavior. So when the media show that our favorite characters behave aggressively and that this results in them getting what they want, we have our inhibitions eroded. Exercise eight. Norman Owen Smith, an ecologist at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, has made a careful study of what he calls mega herbivores. Elephants, rhinos, and hippos—the only surviving land mammals that weigh more than one thousand kilograms as adults. Their size, he has found, makes these animals ecologically unique. Adults are so massive that they are immune to the attacks of lions and other large predators. Yet, mega herbivores are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of human hunting. Owen Smith calculates that the potential growth rate of an African elephant population is no more than 6.5 percent per year. Such a slow-breathing species, he says, would be doomed if any efficient predator began to focus on it. This, he believes, exactly describes the situation of Pleistocene elephants in the Americas. Owen Smith interprets the fact. That the great majority of known Ice Age kill sites involved mammoths or mastodons as evidence that they were humans' preferred prey. There were plenty of smaller animals around to sustain them if they couldn't bag a mega mammal. So human hunting pressure did not let up as elephant numbers dwindled.